Hey everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to our Sunday night service. This is our last Sunday night online only service that we'll be having uh, because growth groups start up next Sunday night on March the 14th. So we're excited about this new Sunday evening format as we go back into our uh, kind of our regular schedule where we had been before uh, our COVID services took effect uh, last March. It's hard to believe that we're almost a year away from everything that changed our world. Uh, so we're uh, just looking forward to being back on Sunday evenings in our growth group format and starting over uh, that uh, style of service. And I hope that you're excited as well. We'll be going through the book of Ruth together in our growth groups. And that's where I want you to turn tonight uh, to Ruth chapter number four. We're going to start at the end of the story. And I really just want to lay some context to growth groups. And those of you who have signed up for growth groups already, thank you for doing that. And if you haven't yet signed up, for a growth group. We still have uh, room in several groups and we want you to sign up. You can go to our website crossroads4me.com and you can do that uh, tonight. Uh, but I want to just really try and give you a, a clear understanding of the time period of what was going on in the nation's history and uh, maybe try and give you some context so that you understand the story as best as you can and uh, hope that it all makes sense. Uh, we know from the first verse that an era of time had started in uh, Ruth chapter one and verse number one. But I want us to go to the last few verses of Ruth chapter number four and really start there as opposed to uh, working our way in sequential order. So Ruth chapter four, and let's begin reading in verse number 17. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, talking about the son that Ruth and Boaz had together, uh, saying, there is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed, he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez begat Hezron, and Hezron begat Ram, and Ram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. A lot of names there. We're not going to dive into each one of them in this setting, uh, but I want to focus on the last verse of the book. It says, And Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. You know, we have to go to a lot of different places in Scripture, and we're going to look at some of those places tonight, and then over the next several weeks throughout growth groups, we're going to look at this passage of Scripture, and how do we get from Ruth chapter 1 to the timeline of the judges to the story of King David? How does all of that transpire and how do we get there? We're going to talk about that, but let's pray together. Father, thank you for the day and the opportunity to be in your word again tonight. Lord, please bless our time. Please speak to our hearts and please help us to see from your word what you desire for us in this setting. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Ruth chapter number one, verse number one, we see a time period mentioned, the period that is mentioned. When you see the uh, correlation and how to see that, you have to really go back to the book of Exodus when you see the children of Israel. You know that Jericho was the first major battle that they took place. We know there was a small uh, battle before then uh, with Ai, but the first major victory that the uh, Lord allowed the Israelites to see was the nation or the, or the city of Jericho in Canaan. Uh, we know that the battle took place about 40 years after they left Egypt, after the captivity and where they walked around through the wilderness. And when they overtook Jericho and the wall uh, came tumbling down, uh, we know that there was one family that was spared, uh, that was given sanctuary, and that was Rahab's family. She was a harlot for uh, our uh, lack of a better word. She was a prostitute. And uh, she was in this city and she was spared because she protected the spies that came in to view the city and obeyed. she obeyed their instructions. And because of that, uh, she was spared. But at what point was this book set in motion? When we get to Ruth chapter 1 and verse number 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. This is after Joshua's death. This is before the time period of the kings when King Saul was made the first king of Israel. This is when the judges ruled. 
ruled. Uh, the period of the judges took place after the death of Joshua, who was the leader after Moses. Uh, the year would have been around 1400 BC, uh, close as we can figure. Joshua's death happened around 1399 BC, so the period of the judges happened around that time. Uh, we know that there was a spiritual emphasis during the days of Joshua, but that time period had come to an end. And by the time we get to Joshua, or Judges rather, chapter 2 and verse number 10, we see it also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, talking about the generation that followed Joshua, and said, And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. We talked about that this past Wednesday night in our series in uh, the book of Exodus. This was a very volatile time for the nation, and there were many who were looking for pleasure and acceptance, but they were looking in all the wrong places. And it reminds me of the time period in which we live today. In 2021, uh, we're some uh, 3,500 years past where they were, but the exact same things that are, were taking place then are the exact same things that are taking place today. Uh, people look for uh, their needs to be satisfied, their greeds to be satisfied, and they overlook their greatest need, which is the need of a Savior. There are a few things in life that we all need, yet we all need a Savior. And saving faith has nothing to do with us, but it has everything to do with Him. John Stott said, Saving faith is resting faith, the trust which relies entirely on the Savior. Saving faith is resting faith, the trust which relies entirely on the Savior. And so we seem to focus our attention and our or on our past or on our mistakes, our failures, things that are behind us. And that's exactly what Satan wants us to do. Uh, Tim Keller said, How does Satan accuse us? By causing us to look at our sin rather than our Savior. See, we've been set free. We've been redeemed. We've been bought with a price. We've been set apart. We've been called. We've been washed. Uh, Paul gave a long list of sin in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and then connected the church to those sins. Uh, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 11, he said, and such were some of you. Some of those things that he mentioned, they were involved in. They had been in their past. They had been connected to those things. And he said, and such were, past tense, some of you. And then he said, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified. Not past tense anymore. But present tense, you are washed, you are redeemed, you are set apart. And this time period was about the time when the people weren't looking for God, which led to a time period of great loss in the famine that we see in verse number 1. There was a famine in the land. Whenever we walk away from the Lord, whenever we have a time period where we disconnect ourselves to His way, His will, His walk, that we're supposed to be on with Him, there will always be a time of spiritual dearth. There will always be a time when there is a famine, maybe not physically, but there will always be a time period of spiritual famine. And these people are seeing that in this time period. But not just the time period, we see the people who are involved here. And you know, we don't see it mentioned here when we get to chapter number 4, but when you go to Matthew chapter number 1 and verse number 5, we see, And Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. Salma was the husband of Rahab, the father of Boaz. See, this man had to have been alive as they entered into Canaan, had to have gone through the wilderness, had to have been alive during the wilderness journey. For him to marry a woman of Jericho, he had to have been alive during that time period. If you go back to Numbers chapter 32 and verse number 11, God speaking and said, Surely none of the men that came out up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham and to Isaac and unto Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. You know, God spoke to Moses and to the leadership and said, you know, anybody who was 20 years and old and upward was not going to see the promised land, save Joshua and Caleb. Those two men got to go into the promised land who were over that age, which means that Salma had to be younger than 20 years old when they left Egypt. 
which means that Salmo was most likely around 60 years old at this time. Uh, the man who married Rahab. Think about it, younger than 20, 40 years in the wilderness, about 60 years old, maybe a little bit younger. But given the cultural acceptance of the day, uh, it was not uncommon for a younger woman to marry a much older man. There was safety in that. Uh, an older man provided the assurance to a family with a daughter that uh, he could take care of their daughter. He could give her a life that would be uh, acceptable in their culture. And history even shows that with Mary and Joseph. Uh, Mary uh, much younger and Joseph much older. But Salma and Rahab get married and they have a son named Boaz. And if Boaz was born shortly after that, then Boaz would have grown up knowing who Joshua was. Joshua would have been his leader. He would have been someone who is uh, very well known in their society. And it's believed that Joshua died around that 1400 year mark. And Boaz was born around 1428. And remember the time uh, works backwards in the Old Testament BC. Uh, dates moving up, all the dates going down. So he would have been about 30 years old when Joshua died. And if you tack on the 10 years of Naomi and Elimelech when they went down into Moab and then Naomi and Ruth come back, uh, that would have put Boaz about 40 years old when we see his name mentioned uh, in chapter number 2. He's related to Elimelech. Uh, that's his family connection. And it was also a man of great character. And we'll talk about that as we go through our growth group. So we've seen the time period, the period of the judges. We've seen the people who are involved. And the, and the story of Ruth really centers around three main characters. Uh, Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz. Those three people are the most significant people in the story. But finally tonight we see the purpose. Why is this story given to us? What was the writer's plan to show us this family, this story of loss? What was the purpose behind it? As we know from our own lives, great story of tragic loss typically uh, precede uh, a picture of triumph. Uh, something going on where there's hope. And when we read the last verse of the book, we see in verse 22 of chapter 4, Obed begat Jesse and Jesse begat David. And when you think about that name, David, we think about the greatest king that Israel had ever seen. We think about uh, the man who was the giant killer. We see the man who was uh, a 40-year monarch over the nation of Israel. The man who was after God's own heart. And all of that story of David's life happened because of a woman who forsook her country and followed a broken widow back home. A, a woman who left everything she had ever known and said, what I see in your life, Naomi, I want for my life. Uh, the people that you're connected to, I want them to be my people. Uh, the way that you live, I want to live that way. The God that you serve and that you're faithfully committed to, I want to serve him. And we see that Naomi lost everything when she chose to leave Bethlehem and go down to Moab. But when she came back home, the Lord restored her. The women in town in chapter 4 and verse number 14, they cheered for Naomi and said, Blessed be the Lord which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. In verse 15 and 16, they praise the fact that she had a grandson. She had a heritage now to carry on her family name, her legacy. And this is a story of redemption. This is how God can take nothing and make something. How could God uh, take this sad situation and turn it around for His glory? And this is the story of Ruth. Now we know the end of the story, how that Jesus would ultimately become, uh, become, be born because of the seed of David. But God's purpose for this story, this book of the Bible, was to show us that He can take the most unlikely events and use them for His glory. How God can take the most unlikely person, a pagan woman from Moab, and He can insert her into His plan. He can take this woman who had no heritage in Israel, no connection, and he can weave her into his story. You know, we don't know what the future holds for us, but we know the one who's already there. We know the one who has already uh, gone before us, who's gone ahead of us, and knows what tomorrow holds. And what I think 
is ironic about the book of Ruth is that God never speaks one time throughout this entire book. Sure, the people talk about Him all the time and His name is covered in every single chapter, yet God never interjects Himself into the conversation. He never includes Himself in the narrative. And you could say, well, preacher, where's God? Uh, Why isn't God speaking? Why isn't He talking? And we might look at the book and say that God is missing, but you can't deny the fact that He's providentially working behind the scenes in this story. He's all over every single page. He's working every way that He always does, just like He does today. Even when we might not see Him, we might not hear Him, we might not hear His voice, but He's still behind the scenes working for our good and ultimately for His glory. That's the story of Ruth, how that God can take one person and bring that one woman throughout a series of events and can take someone who doesn't deserve to be there and put her in His plan. And that's our story as well. Someone who doesn't deserve to be a part of God's plan and how God can insert us into His plan of redemption. But not just our plan, not just His plan of redemption for us, but He takes us and weaves us into His plan of redemption for others. Uh, Just like we talked about this morning in the service and how the gospel truly changes everything and how we've seen the gospel change our lives and others, God wants to use us to impact those around us. And that is the whole purpose of the story of Ruth, how that one person can change everything when they submit themselves to God's ultimate plan. Father, thank you for this story of Ruth and the context behind the study that we're, we'll start next week. Lord, I ask that you please help us to see our story in Ruth's story. Lord, help us to see that you are behind the scenes and you're molding this plan Lord, just please help us to reach and grab these truths that are so significant for us. Lord, please bless us and use us in your plan, in your grand scheme. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you have a great evening. We look forward to growth groups which start next Sunday night at 6 o'clock here in the book of Ruth. We love you. Have a great week.